Well, hello there. Hey, over the last month, I've been sharing uh, with you 40 uh, things that I've learned that I think are important uh, lessons that I've learned in uh, the last 40 years of ministry. And so today, I want to give you the last 10. We've already done 30. If you haven't seen those ones yet, this is part five. So there's four other parts. You can go on YouTube and find those. But uh, the first one I wanted to highlight today, uh, point number 31, was that ministry can drive you. So beware. Now, I remember it wasn't that long ago. I was, um, you know, having a, a time of, of prayer with um, a fellow minister. And they were saying, you know, I'm just so burned out. Um, I'm just, I'm just working around the clock. I feel stressed. I feel warfare on everything. And they were describing to me all the things that they were doing. And I think, you know, when over a period of time we have that level of stress and fatigue, we have to look at it and say, is this, um, Am I doing this in the Lord or am I being driven by vision? And we have to be very careful um, when we're in ministry because the anointing, it just will produce fruit, but then that fruit you have to look after. So you have to be able to gauge it and say, okay, am I still flowing in your spirit, Lord, or am I taking on extra things that is just there because the gift is able to um, look after it? Or are you really saying to do it? If the Lord is saying to do it, there will be a grace for it and there will be peace in it. Um, even in the midst of warfare and, and, and trials, you'll have this uh, knowing that you're being propelled by the peace of the Lord. And so, and that would be with anything, not just if you're in ministry, but um, just in life itself, you have to be careful that you aren't being driven by something and ministry can drive you. The needs of people can drive you, but you always have to be in that place of peace and knowing, um, knowing that, uh, that you have the grace to be able to facilitate. Otherwise you have to pull back and take a look at it. And remember everything that you, you build, you have to look after. It's like having children. Once you give birth to children, you can't just say, okay, well, that was fun birthing it. Now I'll just go off and do something else. Um, you have to raise those children. And it's the same in ministry that whatever you build, you have to care for and look after. Okay, 32 is never let money or favor be a motivator for ministry. And I wish I could say that I've never seen this, but I actually have. I've even heard ministers talk about it. Um, they will say to me things like, you know, I can't go minister there because there's not enough money there. Or they'll say, you know, if I find that if I put out this type of video, I get a lot of likes, it goes viral. And so they go after those things because of the favor that it is giving them. And I always say, no, don't let money or favor be your motivator ever. Um, you need to go by the spirit, let the spirit lead you, but also never forget that you're a servant and that you're to be motivated by love. Number 33, stewardship is more important than acquisition. So you can acquire something, you know, something can be given to you, um, awarded to you, and now you have, have it. Um, but what is your stewardship of that like? Because that is important on how you steward. So um, I remember years ago, my husband and I bought um, a house. It was a very much a fixer upper. But the story, the history behind the house was that it had belonged to um, an older gentleman who then got sick and went into the hospital and passed. And the property was given to his grandson. The grandson took it and basically um, made it a party house and it came to shambles. So by the time we got it, it was thrashed. Um, the the uh, grandfather had taken very good care of it over the years. It was in good shape. But when the grandson acquired it, um, he didn't look after it. He abused the use of it. He didn't care for it. He didn't take care of things properly. So actually almost everything in the house had to be repaired and fixed or rebuilt or whatever. And so um, when you are given something, it could be money given into a ministry. It could be um, a ministry assignment or a place of favor. Are you going to steward it well? 
I remember uh, when um, I was in nurses training and we were in like an internship part of our program it was called the practical um, end of it where we would go and practically do things and we were being watched on how we were stewarding the information that we had learned okay so um, you, we had to do well in our practical work, take care of things well in order to uh, pass our final exam. And so stewardship is really important. In ministry, it is really important how you steward, especially the funding that comes in. I remember talking to um, a minister one time who was kind of boasting on how much money their ministry had brought in, and, and I was looking at them, spending it frivolously. And I've always spoken to our staff and said, you know, you make sure that you steward every dollar well, because we don't know um, what the what the story is behind those who are giving. They are giving sacrificially, many of them, as unto the Lord. Um, I know of elderly people who have given, you know, a real sacrificial gift because they were just living on a little pension and they were giving from that to bless the work of the Lord. Uh, one of our first partners was a little eight-year-old boy who was giving his allowance every every month into the work of the Lord because he knew he was giving unto God. And so you cannot abuse that or misuse it. You need to steward that well. And same with the stewardship of your gift. We are gifted by God, not because we deserved it or learned it even, but because he gave it to us. So we need to steward it well. So it's not so much what you acquire, but it's how you steward it, how you look after it. Um, number 34. I've learned to do more with less. Um, I remember years ago, our ministry had been very fruitful in our assignments, so we kept um, building and bringing on more staff and, and, and acquiring more equipment and things that we needed to do the work. And before we knew it, it was running very, very inefficiently. It was almost like when you build a house, you start with one room, let's say, and then you, know, you grow out of that room and you think, I should build another room, and then you build another room on that room and another room on that room, and before you know it, you have to go through this room to this room to this room to get to that room and it and it becomes very inefficient so we were in that place and the Lord spoke to me he said I'm going to teach you how to do more with less because remember that everything that you build you have to maintain you have to look after it takes more time it takes more people it, it, it is it is much more involved and so he's taught me he says just um, make good use of what I give you and be very efficient in what I've given you. So I've learned to do uh, more and have more fruitfulness with less pressure, with less administration, uh, with less funds needed even. Um, and so it's a, a much better stewardship of what the Lord puts into your hands. Number 35, live your life to build and bless others. It has been such a privilege to be spoken to by the Lord in the very beginning of our ministry and said, would you lay down your life in order to bless others, to build other people up and build them up beyond yourself even, you know, so that you're always looking to build your, build your people up beyond where you've walked so that they can do beyond that, so that they can do even better. And I found that to live my life for others has been such a blessing. And it's like, when you do that, blessings always follow you, but you're so fulfilled in being, to be, uh, being able to be a blessing to others. Number 36, live with an eternal view and so into an eternal realm. So the earth that we're living in right now and the world that you're living in right now, it's just, it's, it's just going to come and go. Your life in the earth, the scripture says, is like a vapor. And I especially see that now. Um, you know, I, I, I turned 70 this coming week at the time of this recording. And it, it's like it's gone so fast. 70 years has gone so fast. And the Lord... Um, is, is, is teaching me to number my days so that I can come into the fullness of wisdom and finish strong. But, you know, possibly I only have like only 25 more years. And so I want to make those years count. So I could sow into the natural life, 
but there's something about sowing into eternity, the things that, that really count, the things that are on God's heart, to give him the things that he's looking for with an eternal view. And I love Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. It says, set your, your mind on the things above where Christ is seated and not on the things of the earth. And so um, God has constantly said that. Build your life in such a way that you're sowing into eternity because that's what lives on for the glory of God. And don't be too serious about all the stuff that goes on in the earth because it comes and goes, it's fickle, it, it, it just, there's nothing really stable in the earthly realm. But in the, in the eternal realm, definitely there's stability. Number 37, the Lord has taught me the value of praying in tongues. And I love praying in tongues. And it's so easy to pray in tongues. And I've done a whole teaching on that recently. Um, I did it for my uh, web church and I've been encouraging people to pray in tongues because it, it says in the scripture that when we pray in tongues, we are actually advancing our spiritual life. We're edifying ourselves. We're edifying our spiritual man, building it up. And when we don't know how to pray as well. When we pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit is, is making the prayers for us according to his will, according to his purpose. It's so powerful. There's so many benefits of praying in tongues. And I just want to encourage all of you that, that um, if you want to accelerate in spiritual growth, praying in tongues is uh, one of the greatest gifts that you can operate in. If you're watching this and you don't pray in tongues, if you go to my store on patriciaking.com, um, um, there is a teaching called tongues and you can download it it's audio teaching and most people are speaking in tongues before they finish listening to that audio i have a little book on it as well okay um, next uh, number 38 is to renew the mind it is important now it says in in the scripture that our mind is renewed through the washing of the water of the word it's renewed through the word and I've been finding more than ever, I've always read the Bible from the moment I was born again. I started reading the Bible and God started speaking to me through it. But I found that it's very important to read the whole Bible. It'll keep everything in proper balance in your life, even though there might be times as you're walking with the Lord that there'll be certain subjects that you want to study out. And that's really good. And it's good to do character studies and word studies and topical studies. All those things are important. But to make sure you get the whole word, that it will balance um, out everything and um, your mind will be renewed through it. And Julie Myers um, was, uh, has been teaching us for, for years to sing the word out, to, to take a scripture and to sing it out. And when she was doing her studying on, on the power of the song, she discovered that in Alzheimer's patients, for example, they might forget all kinds of details. They might even forget their own name, but oftentimes they can remember songs that they learned when they were in Sunday school. And that we rem re remember songs sometimes more than we remember actual verses or words. So I just want to encourage you not only to read the word, but to speak the word and to sing the word um, because it will renew your mind. It'll make your mind sharp, but it'll keep you in the truth as well. And um, a friend of mine 
recently has committed herself to reading 30 chapters of the Bible every single day. And she's been testifying on what a difference it is making to her, the peace that it is giving uh, her, and the mental alertness and the understanding and the revelation that has opened up to her. And that's just by reading and letting the, the uh, spirit quicken things to you. It is so powerful. And I just want to, you know, I always try to read at least two or three chapters a day. But I just want to encourage you, and be, because I find if I only read one, I mean, I'll always get something out of it. But there's something about going into that second or third chapter that the revelatory portal does open up more. So I just want to encourage you. It doesn't take long to do, but it's so, so powerful. Number uh, 39 is divine order and truth will bring divine glory. And I remember um, when I first received this revelation was when I was looking at Moses, when God gave him the pattern for the tabernacle. And he gave it to him supernaturally, but he said, build this according to the pattern. Now, when Moses did, according to everything that God showed him to do and the timing, because God showed him what to build first, how to build it, what materials to use, when he did it according to God's order, according to God's truth that had been given to him, then when he built it, the divine glory came. And the Lord spoke to me, he said, if you will do things according to my ways, my order, you will see my divine glory. And we are to align with God. And we're living in a day when oftentimes people want God to align with them, even with their emotional beliefs, saying, well, God would never do this because it doesn't feel right to me. Or, um, you know, if he really loved everyone, he wouldn't be doing this. You cannot make God conform into your image. You have to conform into his. He doesn't obey your plumb line. You're to obey his. It's his divine order and then glory comes. When you go against God's order, when you go against his truth, it is disastrous. It will, you know, it, it says in the Bible that there's a way that seems right to a man, but his end is destruction. And so that's why we always do things according to God's order, according to his divine order. You work against that order and you will be sorry. And we're living in a day when God's order is being challenged. His very word is being challenged. People are saying, oh, the scriptures aren't really anything. You know, they're just maybe some good lessons you can learn out of them. No, we have to be sure in who we believe and we have to uh, know that his word is true and it's inspired by the spirit. And then the final thing I'd like to share with you as far as lessons learned is how amazing God's grace is. God's grace is truly amazing. We sing it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And grace is the influence of God upon your life that causes you to do his will and to live out your life. And so that's why like Peter and, and Paul and, and James and others would always um, ask for a multiplication of grace upon their people. Why? Because when you've got that influence activated in your life, you will manifest the very nature of God and his goodness. And so grace, I've learned to hold on to grace, let grace have its work. It says in Philippians 2.13 that God is at work within us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's the description of his grace and of course there's divine favor that that is involved in that as well but the reason why I love grace is because when I'm under grace I find myself doing the will of God now we know that in the scripture there's teachings on grace versus law and I've heard people say that you know just don't listen to uh, the law and don't um, pay any attention to the commandments you're under grace there's actually no sin there's no need uh, to um, intentionally uh, obey the word of God because you're under grace and that is ridiculous and some of the most powerful uh, books in the Bible that teach on grace especially grace versus law would be Romans Romans and uh, Galatians and Ephesians, they teach on grace versus law and the spirit versus flesh. Um, so we'll see like the Galatian church, for example, um, they were going back into religious 
uh, rituals in that, like cleansing rituals, circumcision, um, uh, observing certain days and feasts and, and, and things that were in the Jewish law that were external, that they were trying to make themselves right by, by doing all those external things. So that's what is being referred to as law versus grace. It wasn't like, oh, you're under grace now, so you don't have to walk in morals. You don't have to walk in integrity. Um, you don't have to obey the word on those things. That is ridiculous. Um, a grace will enable you to fulfill all the good things of the kingdom of God. And we've got this beautiful kingdom that is righteous and pure and, and love filling the atmosphere and everything is just flawless. There's no sin there. There's no sorrow. There's no death. There's none of that. There's no immoral behaviors in the kingdom of God. And so that's what the grace brings us into that and actually causes us to manifest those pure behaviors because we are brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. So grace enables you to walk in that. And grace causes um, you to walk in the spirit rather than the flesh. Grace enables you to do that. So I always say, let's have more grace. Let's walk in it. But um, the word and the truth in the word, such as, um, you know, uh, live a life free from uh, um, adultery, fornication, the things that are mentioned in the New Testament and the Old Testament. But you want to, to know that that is the word of God that is representing the kingdom. There is no immorality in the kingdom. There's no adultery, fornication, homosexuality, drunkenness, lying, slander, gossip. There's none of that stuff in the kingdom of God. So grace then will enable you to live in the behaviors and the influence of the kingdom of God. So I just want to finish this off because that is number 40 by saying my prayer for you is that you will have exceedingly great grace poured out upon your life, enabling grace that influences you to live out the Christ nature within you. Amen. So I hope you've enjoyed these little nuggets that I've learned in 40 years of ministry, the things that I believe that have really um, helped me remain strong in the Lord. And again, it's not how well you start, it's how strong you finish. And so let's all finish strong and I speak a strong finish over your life. And I am grateful to each of you and I'm grateful above all to the Holy Spirit who has led me in 40 years of ministry and given me so many great opportunities to share the life of Jesus and everything that is good about him. God bless you and thank you.